It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Why Downtowns Matter, sponsored by Frontier Communications. We're really excited to host this topic today, featuring Chris Moore, who's the Executive Director of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. Downtowns are the heart of a city and a region. A healthy, vibrant downtown is an indicator of the economic condition of a city. A downtown is the home to locally owned, independent businesses that keep 68% of their revenue recycling back into a community. It tells us who we are, who we were, and how the past has shaped us. It defines our entrepreneurial culture and identity. Downtowns serve as a space where members of all segments of the community can come together for community events. In the fall of 2014, the Tri-Cities Branding Committee received the final Branding Development and Marketing Plan from Tourism, Community Branding, and Downtown Development expert, Roger Brooks. At the top of Brooks's list was the recommendation to help retain and grow the downtown core areas in our community. Our local downtown partner associations have implemented new and creative ideas to revitalize our downtowns, to attract business, industry, residents, jobs, and a diverse workforce to the region. So now it's time for our program. We're pleased to welcome Chris Moore to the Tri-Cities today. Chris is the current Executive Director of Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, holding the executive position since 2013. He joined the Trust in 2005 as the organization's first field director. As the Director of Advocacy for the Trust, he has traveled extensively throughout the state, meeting property owners, grassroots preservationists, and elected officials, working with them to achieve positive outcomes for threatened historic places in their communities. In his tenure, Chris has also managed two of the Trust's most important long-standing programs, the Most Endangered Historic Properties Program, which focuses the Trust advocacy efforts on the community nominated list of historic properties threatened by demolition or neglect, and the Valerie Savinsky Washington Preservations Fund, which provides small but meaningful grants to groups working to save cherished community landmarks. Chris is passionate about helping cities establish and sustain a vibrant downtown culture where citizens love to come to work, gather, share history, and do business. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Chris Moore and invite him to the stage. Uh, first of all, thank you to Lori and uh, thank you to the Chamber as well for the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. It's, um, it's a great honor for me and, and it's, it's funny to some degree too to be speaking in front of a Chamber of Commerce. In the world of historic preservation advocacy, uh, oftentimes we are categorized as chaining ourselves in front of buildings uh, to stop what others might uh, consider to be progress uh, when demolitions or other types of redevelopment might be taking place. And I'm here hopefully to dispel that myth to some degree. I have never chained, chained myself in front of a building, uh, but we certainly have advocated for the reuse and rehabilitation of historic structures as part of a vibrant part of, of a community. Uh, the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, let me see if this is going to work and go all the way. There we go. Go all the way to this. Is, this is a long range clicker that needs to go all the way to the back of the room. Uh, but just quickly, the Washington Trust is a statewide advocacy organization. We've been around since 1976, and our mission is really to instill a preservation ethic across the state to preserve and rehabilitate historic structures. And we try and do this through education, advocacy, collaboration, and stewardship. So Lori was kind enough to mention some of our programs, and I just want to give you a quick, a quick look into, uh, into what those are. Uh, she mentioned our most endangered historic properties list. This is, this is the program that gives us the uh, chain yourself to the building reputation. Uh, but we do, we do highlight properties each year that are facing a variety of threats. And ultimately, we really work with all stakeholders involved to find a positive Positive preservation outcome for those for those properties. You see a few here. A lot of you will probably recognize the Teapot Dome gas station, a great resource that uh, is is a save because of a whole lot of partners, some great funding from the 
feds as well, and great local resources. Uh, the one in the middle is the Enlo Dam Powerhouse on the Similkameen River up in the Okanagan Valley, a National Register listed property, which actually is free for the taking. That doesn't mean you can move it, but if you have an idea for the use of this from a recreational or heritage tourism standpoint, you can work with the Okanagan Valley PUD and actually acquire this building. So we're, we're in a partnership with them to try and get the word out about that opportunity. And then finally, the one on the right is a, a, a fire lookout, which was slated to be demolished because of a claim that it violated the Federal Wilderness Act, we ultimately got it saved through an act of Congress which exempted the building from that act. But just a couple of examples of how advocacy can help to save those places that matter. Um, and then Lori mentioned our very small grant program. I throw this out there because many of you may own buildings or may lease buildings that would be eligible for this program. They are small, $1,000 to $2,000, but what we found is sometimes that $1,000 or $2,000 acts as seed money for additional uh, funding, or it, it really helps get a very small, discrete part of a job done that might be uh, a really important part of an overall rehabilitation project. So I wanted to mention that quickly. Uh, and then we are very lucky. I was just talking with someone at my table. We are very fortunate to be the proud owners of the Stimson Green Mansion in Seattle's First Hill neighborhood. So if you ever are uh, uh, in First Hill for whatever reason, do come do come visit us. We we have it as uh, we have it open for tours, and we also use it as event space. So we are trying to be entrepreneurial with the own assets that we have as well. Uh, I wanted to talk about collaboration because that's one of the key things we do and it's one of the key things that everybody needs to do when we're talking about uh, uh, making places that are important, making places that are viable and attractive for our communities. Uh, a couple of, of quick programs. We collaborate with the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation to manage a grant program designed to rehabilitate historic barns. There are now over 660 designated heritage barns across the state of Washington. We have at least one in each county. Um, and there have been, for the last about seven years, there have been grant funds available to help with the rehabilitation of those. This, these barns, the one on top is uh, the Straub Barn in Lincoln County, just outside Davenport. The one down below is the Heidenreich Dairy, and it is just outside of Colfax, in the, uh, just off the Palouse Scenic Byway. Great program, leverages local resources, local volunteerism to help bring uh, barns back to life. We're real proud of that. And then the other one that we do with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation is a county courthouse grant program. And certainly a lot of folks here will recognize the Franklin County Courthouse. That was actually the, the first recipient of this grant program and to date still the largest single recipient for the wonderful uh, rehabilitation project that happened uh, to the courthouse in Pasco, which is going back now about, about 10 years, but it still, still looks really good. Uh, in fact, this, this courthouse rehabilitation project that happened in Franklin County was in a lot of ways the impetus, the catalyst for the statewide program. That program has now awarded over 17 million in matching grants to 26 different counties across the state that possess historic county courthouses. And in turn, that, that nearly 18 million has leveraged well over 40, uh, 45 actually, an overall capital improvement to these great buildings. So again, real good collaboration. And then finally, the one I wanted to talk about, which is kind of most near and dear to what, what I'll be discussing today, is our uh, partnership that we have with, again, the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation to manage the state's Main Street program. I know you've heard, uh, well, we've got great representation here from some of our participating programs, and I'll talk more about that later, but hopefully people are familiar with it. Uh, this was a program that just about six years ago was truly endangered, uh, in danger of being lost during the Great Recession as uh, state agencies were looking to cut budgets, the program had been in the Department of, what was then the Department of uh, Community the 
Department of Community, Trade, and Economic Development, CTED. It's now the Department of Commerce. I'm glad they changed the name. It's much easier to say. Uh, but it was uh, in the Department of Commerce. And as a budget saving measure, they were ready to scuttle the program, essentially. Didn't think it was worth their time to continue doing. Uh, the program was moved from Commerce to the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation because preservation is a key underpinning of the Main Street approach. And since that time, uh, we have worked with that agency again to, to manage the program, and we're really, really proud of that. Statewide right now, there are 34 programs that are uh, officially designated as Washington State Main Streets. Some of those programs, a good handful of them, are also nationally accredited Main Streets with the National, uh, with the national Main Street Program, which is a program originally started by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So more on that in a, in a little bit. Um, but I did want to give kind of an overview of why downtowns matter. And, and I probably shouldn't, shouldn't say this in starting a, a discussion, but I'm probably not going to tell you a whole lot you don't already know. What I'm hoping to do is give you a little sense of, of uh, reification, if you will, validity, that what, in looking at some of the uh, presentations in the back and talking to some people already here, give you some validity to what is already going on to what you're thinking about. Lori talked about the branding that's happened, some of the outcomes of that, and, and give you a sense of some of the ideas around this, this concept of placemaking, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that are trending nationally and also that are happening uh, across the state as well. So it's uh, in some ways a little bit of a 30,000 foot approach uh, uh, looking down. But I just wanted to start with, with kind of why downtowns matter, and certainly, uh, th these are kind of obvious ones, but the economics of downtowns are obviously key for our communities. And oftentimes, our downtowns, our government centers, whether they're homes to City Hall, this is uh, Port Townsend, hopefully many of you have been there, or whether they're the, the seats of our county government in Prosser, you've got the historic courthouse uh, being the seat of Benton County. Uh, so, as, as government centers, there's a civic discourse that goes with that. There's a concentration of activity that's associated with uh, government centers that make our downtowns a, a, a key asset from that point alone. Okay. There are also business centers, of course, right? Historically, whether it was because of the advantage of place, being next to a river, being next to uh, uh, resources that are uh, created economic activity, some strategic location, that's where downtown started because of the business that was there. <clears throat> on the left, any, anyone, any idea the, the image on the left? Walla Walla in the early days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on the right, uh, we see Kent as well a little bit later, but still early enough that there's some uh, quote unquote old fashioned automobiles. But certainly our downtowns are business centers. Because of those two things, they're also, of course, employment centers uh, with those two components a part of it. And, and I wanted to note, and again, maybe, maybe many of you know this, but the Small Business and Entrepreneurial Council noted that in, oh, you are wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. But in, in 2012, the Small Business and Entrepreneurial Council noted that according to Census Bureau data, businesses with less than 20 workers made up 89.6 of all businesses in the United States. So that's a pretty significant number, 89.6. If you actually add in what they call non-employer businesses, that number goes to about 98%. Non-employer businesses, sole proprietorship, someone where it's really just them running the business. I don't count them in, in that overall because oftentimes they're working from home or they might not have a, a, a quote unquote place of business. But still, if you think about 90% of businesses in the US have uh, fewer than 20 employees, it really shows you how our small, local, quote unquote, Main Street businesses are, uh, play such a critical role in the employment formula for our regions, for our communities. Um, and then tax base, of course, is, is one that comes right into this. We, we know, I was talking with Lori a little bit about this earlier, in, in our downtowns, the last 50 years, 
uh, maybe the last 10 or 15 excluded, but there had been kind of creeping, slow disinvestment. This, was, this came from policies at the federal level on down. It came from a variety of demographic factors, the uh, expansion of suburbs, our transit policies, the explosion of federal highways and what that uh, did to our downtowns. Um, but uh, over time, what happened, of course, was a disinvestment. And, and you can see from these images, nobody wants their downtowns to have these uh, uh, symbols out there, boarded up buildings, uh, vacant storefronts. These are the death knell for, for downtowns. Um, none of these images are from Washington State, but they could be. Uh, I think all of you have been in a downtown where you've seen some vacancies like this. Of course, this is devastating for your tax base. Our downtowns constitute a, a significant portion of our community's tax base, and where you have this kind of disinvestment, property values, of course, go down. There's no sales tax being generated here. Those lower revenues, in turn, impact the ability of local and state governments to take tax revenue that they have and reinvest into communities. So all in all, it's um, obviously not a good thing. So that tax base piece is why downtowns matter as well. Uh, and then the last one I want to talk about is, is infrastructure. And I think that the infrastructure component is one that, that we can all understand readily, but I also want to take a little bit of a kind of preservation twist on this. In historic preservation, we talk a lot about embodied energy. And this, this came up, has come up in really the last decade with a look to sustainability and making the connection between rehabbing existing buildings and that being a sustainable practice. Uh, so often we were hearing over the last decade that a building needed to be demolished and a new building built because that old building was not energy efficient. In the name of energy efficiency, year over year operational costs, we need to build new and build green. Well, the idea of embodied energy is one that also takes into consideration basically what that, the, it takes into consideration the sum total of energy that is present in an existing building. And that sum total includes the energy required to extract raw materials, to manufacture those materials into finished products, to transport those products, and then install building materials. So all of that energy from the very first time you might be digging in the ground for raw materials or, or cutting trees down, all of that energy has to be considered when you look at a building from the 19-teens or 20s or 30s. It's not just knocking down what some might consider to be a poor performing building, and even that's arguable, for a new efficient building. You've got to take a look at that. And then when you take a look at the fact that building a new building also costs a lot in terms of the energy just to get it constructed. You can't look at a new building just in terms of its year-over-year -year operational costs. You have to look at the long-term view of when that carbon footprint will, will be paid off for that building. So this is the idea of embodied energy and historic preservation, and I wanted to extrapolate that into thinking about infrastructure in our communities. In our downtowns, that infrastructure sewer, electrical, communication systems, street improvements, all of these things cost money and all of them exist already in our downtowns. So they, they, our downtowns already represent an incredible amount of public and private investment. And as we push development away from the downtown core, the cost of providing that infrastructure increases for both the users from a private investment standpoint, but also for local jurisdictions as well as they're responsible for providing, for providing services. So there's an inherent advantage economically to utilizing the existing buildings in our downtown core, and we should be taking advantage of those pre-existing services. Um, I like to show this, to, anyone have any, raise your hand if you have any idea where this building is. It is in Washington. You may not recognize it in its state here. I like to show this one because to me it represents on a very small micro, small town main street level, um, a lot of those things I was just talking about in terms of, of why downtowns matter and, and some of the advantages of downtown. Um, this is the Dorsey Building in Dayton and about uh, eight, nine years ago it looked like that. Today it looks like this. And uh, maybe you recognize it now because you've seen it right in downtown Dayton's Main Street. It's close to 
they're, well, it's a national registered listed district, so it's got that sense of place, the, the history behind it. It's obviously in the, in close to other businesses. And in fact, in rehabbing this building, going from here to here, it added two businesses because you now have a couple of restaurants, you have um, another commercial entity next door, and you actually have some living space upstairs. <clears throat> so you're also adding to mixed use as well. And finally, because of its, uh, because of its location, it, it, th the perspective's a little off, but essentially the Dorsey Building does sit immediately adjacent to the Columbia County Courthouse in Dayton. So it's got that connection to Government Center as well, which, which we talked about earlier. This is just a teeny tiny small project, but it's one of the reasons that investments in downtown and in Main Streets make sense, not just from a feel-good standpoint, but from an economic standpoint as well. Um, incidentally, the Columbia County Courthouse has been a recipient of some of those grants and is, is our state's, you all probably know this, but is our state's oldest uh, continuing courthouse that's still in use as such. I believe it's from 1887. Um, but here's what we want to talk about in terms of community and why downtowns matter from that standpoint. And so a couple of thoughts about that. Uh, independent ownership. Most of the businesses in your downtown are independently owned. They support a local family who supports the local schools. Profits from these businesses subsequently stay in town. And Lori talked about that uh, in, in her earlier remarks. I think I heard the percentage of 68%. That's, that's a pretty good percentage. But certainly, that local investment engenders more local investment and obviously is something we know about our independently owned businesses. And these are just a couple of examples uh, across the state in our downtowns, Mount Vernon on the left, Chelan on the right. When you look at these, and it's hard to see from the small, uh, from the small pictures, but you can see those storefronts, you can see a, a period of development represented here that doesn't work for chain stores necessarily. The, the, the varying layouts may not work for a type of program that, that someone may want to have when they're franchising or from a national chain. So it does, our building stock in downtowns actually attract independent ownership because they may not be as well suited for chains. That's not to say chains are bad. That's certainly not what we're saying in any way, shape, and form. But what we're saying is that downtowns are all, already set up to attract local businesses, which again, are perhaps more, uh, in the long term, more, more advantageous for our local communities. And then quality of life. We can use any kind of term that we want in, in talking about quality of life, but I think everyone kind of understands this, this idea and, and what it means. Downtown is a reflection of how your community sees itself, and so a vibrant, engaged downtown is key for attracting investment, both in terms of residents and, and business, of course. Um, what you see here in, in these examples are really the opposite of those disinvestment slides that, that we saw earlier. Uh, I, I like to show these couple of examples, and maybe you've seen them. The one on the left is in Camus. It's a, it's a plein air painting festival that they have. And then the one on the right is in Langley, and um, I love this. It's, it's a parade that's part of Langley's Welcome the Whales Day. Uh, it's so very, it's so very uh, Whidbey Island to have Welcome the Whales Day. I think it's, it's, it's great. Uh, but obviously, those slides of disinvestment with boarded up uh, businesses and buildings are bad billboards for downtown. These are, are really good billboards and activities for downtown, obviously. Um, The other thing I wanted to note with, with, the, with community is this idea of authenticity. Uh, we talk about this in the realm of historic preservation all the time. What does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to have uh, uh, those, to highlight and celebrate those assets in your community that really represent who your community is and, and, and the story your community has to tell. This is, it can be a tricky one uh, because we see really good examples from other places in the state or other places nationally or even internationally and you say, I'm gonna do that. But you might not be able to because if your community, if your downtown doesn't have that story, then you might not be able to program a certain thing. Um, We've all been to Leavenworth, right? Has everyone here has been to Leavenworth? 
uh, I would argue that this is not the way to move forward with planning uh, a, a sense of place for your own community. Now, granted, it's worked in Leavenworth, uh, and, and they seem to be doing fine. Uh, they have their, their parades. I still, I, I still can't get over the men in lederhosen in downtown Leavenworth, but uh, it's work there. It won't work anywhere else in Washington because we have our Leavenworth now. It's not, it's not going to work again. And, and in fact, Leavenworth brings up, from a historic preservation standpoint, a kind of interesting conundrum. Uh, the threshold for being considered historic is 50 years. Any buildings, resources that are 50 years old or more are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Well, uh, Leavenworth, and you got to give them credit. They went all in on the Bavarian theme. They just, everyone did it. Uh, but that, that planning process was from the late 60s, early 70s, when the whole town Bavarianized. And so it raises this question, when, when Bavarian Leavenworth turns 50, do we have to consider it a historic resource? Uh, it's something a lot of us are, are, are kind of arguing about. But um, authenticity is, is certainly important uh, in terms of embracing your community, again, for what it is. I want to talk about uh, and go over briefly a study that recently came out uh, through the National Trust for Historic Preservation and what they call their Preservation Green Lab. Uh, and this takes a, a good look. It, it was a study that they did to, to basically get my right page here. To basically, basically measure how the character of buildings and, and downtown blocks influence urban vitality. So I'll state off the bat, uh, right from the start that they focused on three cities, Seattle, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. Now these are big, big cities, obviously, but I think some of the lessons, some of the findings uh, can be taken and applied to our smaller communities with their local downtowns. Big cities, San Francisco and, and uh, Seattle are good examples. Yes, they're big cities and they have a central business district, but they're also residential cities and, and cities comprised of neighborhoods, each having, in a lot of cases, their own commercial core as well. And so what we're finding, what, what they found in some of those neighborhood studies actually apply to smaller towns and cities on a whole with their downtowns. But it was the idea that older and smaller um, is in fact better when it comes to building stock. And so I want to just go through a few of the things that I think apply specifically to what we're looking at. Um, nightlife is actually most alive on streets with a diverse range of building ages. Now, how did they determine this? This is a very millennial study. They determined it by uh, cell phone activity. Uh, and so they looked in San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and they said that city blocks composed of mixed vintage buildings host greater cell phone activity on Friday nights. And in Seattle, areas with older, smaller buildings see greater cell phone use and also have more businesses open at 10 p.m. on a Friday. So here we are, tracking cell phone usage to determine where people want to go, and lo and behold, where are they wanting to go, uh, places with a diverse range of building ages. Older, mixed-use neighborhoods are more walkable. I think that's a pretty obvious finding, we know. Uh, they determined that young people love old buildings. I don't know what their metric was for that. Uh, you got to read the report to find out, but I'm glad that they have that in there. I think it's wonderful. Um, but some of the more economically related ones as well is that older business districts provide affordable, flexible space for entrepreneurs from all backgrounds. When you have neighborhoods with smaller scale, and a mix of old and new buildings, they host a significantly higher proportion of new businesses, as well as more women and minority-owned businesses than areas with predominantly larger new buildings. So again, this mix of, of vintages, this mix of sizes, actually is an entrepreneurial draw. The creative economy. This, this perhaps elusive segment of the, of the economy, thrives in older mixed-use neighborhoods. So again, in Seattle and in D.C., the study found older, smaller buildings house significantly greater concentrations of creative jobs per square foot. Media production businesses, software publishers, performing arts companies can be found in areas that have smaller scaled historic fabric. So it also draws that creative sector. Older, smaller buildings provide space for a strong local economy. That was one of the outcomes. And then older and commercial 
and mixed use districts, those districts that have a variety of uses, be they residential and commercial or other mixes, actually contain what they call hidden density. And I think that's an interesting one as well uh, to look at. But the, the report also had some findings about what you can do as a city. And there, again, are a couple that, that I think speak directly to this, this notion of why downtowns matter and the role they can play in revitalization. Um, the first is that it's really important to fit old and new together at a human scale. You all know what it's like walking down a, a city street where everything is seemingly a thousand feet above you. Uh, it simply doesn't feel human and it doesn't necessarily always engender the type of activity that we, we want to see in our communities that encourage um, civic activity, encourage discourse, uh, encourage a presence from people even. But uh, findings from all three cities show that mixing buildings from different vintages, which do include modern buildings, support social and cultural activity in commercial and mixed zones. So again, this isn't, it, it's not a manifesto against new development or against new buildings, but it's talking about a balance and a mix. Um, one of the other things I think which is great that came out of this is to support neighborhood evolution, not revolution. This statement can probably be directly linked to the urban renewal policies. The urban renewal policies of, of the 50s and beyond where entire neighborhoods, neighborhoods were simply demolished to make way for progress. Um, it took a long time for neighborhoods, it takes a long time for neighborhoods to establish themselves, and that change is going to be gradual as well. It's not going to happen overnight, so you don't need an instantaneous revolution in how you approach revitalization. But again, looking at the neighborhood for what it is and understanding that an incremental approach is one over time that will ultimately get you to where, where you want to be. And then one of them, again, which directly related to historic preservation, make it easier to reuse small buildings. Sometimes our code issues and other types of zoning that might be out there, local land use regulations can be very prohibitive. Seattle's going to have a huge one coming up that is, is a, a real problem for historic buildings. They're going to probably in the next two years uh, pass an ordinance that requires unreinforced masonry buildings to be seismically upgraded. And it's going to put those costs on the owner. It's going to be mandated that by a certain date, uh, this seismic retrofit is, is accomplished. I think the only reason they haven't passed it yet is because they're not sure yet how to mitigate what that cost is going to be to all those owners. And in many cases, those unreinforced masonry buildings are in our historic districts, are historic buildings that are landmarks themselves. And if an owner is suddenly forced out of business or something is, is, is so expensive that they don't have an option but to demolish and allow someone to come in and build new, then we're going to be in, in, um, in, a, in, a, in a lot of trouble in terms of our historic fabric. So there are, th this whole study is online, and I certainly encourage you to take a look at all of the findings that are there. Uh, because they are um, extremely relevant for what we're trying to do in, in downtowns. Okay, I'm back to my other, other pages. In talking more about community and, again, connected to that historic preservation side of things, but I wanted to bring up placemaking. You've probably heard this term, a lot of discussion, a lot of activity around placemaking. Real quick, a couple of the definitions. It's a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. It capitalizes on a local community's assets, inspiration, and potential, and you can see the rest. Again, this is the idea that you're going to capitalize on what your community has, what's authentic to your community, the advantages your community has potentially um, to, uh, compared to others. So I wanted to just quickly talk about <clears throat> a, a, a organization called Project for Public Spaces. This is sort of their, how well can you see it? It's okay, it's sort of hard to see up there, but I, I really like this graphic because it sort of reminds me of those Pantone color wheels from the past, you're you know, sitting there trying to think about what color for the bedroom and you've got your color wheel out here. Well, this, this graphic kind of takes that, that idea and focuses on um, really on four main attributes, which are, are in the center and, and hard to read, but sociability, uses and activities, comfort and image, access and linkages. 
in a lot of ways, these are different words to describe some of the things we've already talked about in terms of the, the benefits or assets that downtown has. Uh, so there's nothing really revolutionary about any of these topics, but this wheel provides what I think of as an easy to comprehend visual for the connected nature of these elements. And, and what they try and do is go uh, in the center, they go from the key attributes, which are those four I just mentioned, of a community. It expands out into intangibles, but then that, that outer circle is really key measurements. So it, it includes things like uh, land use patterns, real estate values, the, the level of volunteerism, and how those different measurables are actually associated with the key attributes. So is every community going to be able to hit every single one of these things? No, but again, it's a guide to help you look at those elements in your community which you have and which you can build on. So uh, I, I certainly encourage people to take a look at Project for Public Spaces as an example, a, a guide, a template of sorts for part of the decision making that occurs when you're looking at your own downtowns. Um, they do have 10 strategies that they talk about as well. And I wanna quickly look at them. I'm not gonna discuss every single one. But the first is a very, very important one, and it's improve streets as places. And again, they're project for public spaces. So they're not talking necessarily about the private realm or privately owned buildings, although those play a very important role in that creation of public space as well. But streets are, are uh, almost an obsession of this group. And if we think about streets, for a long time now, streets have simply been, they've been constructed to move people and goods through places. They, they aren't constructed anymore with the idea of creating a space or, or creating a kind of viable place where people might gather. So they really focus on improving streets as places. Create squares and parks as multi-use destinations. Build local economies through markets. Design buildings to support places link a public health agenda to a public space agenda. I think this is a really uh, a key one. We're starting to see this a lot more in urban planning. Walkability scores, of course, are directly tied to public health. Um, reinvent community planning. Utilize the power of 10 plus. This is the idea that if your neighborhood uh, has 10 great places people can go to, that's a benchmark to meet. And then maybe your city gets 10 great neighborhoods, uh, and it expands from there, so they kind of use this power of 10 idea. Um, create a comprehensive public space agenda. Start small and experiment, which I think is really key. And then restructure government to support public spaces. So I want to, uh, I'm not gonna spend more time on that. The, their website is, is there, and I do encourage people to look at it, but I wanna look at a couple of just local examples, I think, of where not all, but some of these ideas play a role as they're implemented locally. Uh, anyone recognize this picture? Know where, know where this is? Yeah, you, you know, because we've been, we've been talking about this. Um, this is downtown Yakima, uh, the, the public parking lot that's, that's right there in the heart of what is a National Register Historic District, the heart of their uh, Main Street as well. And for three years, they've been planning for what is called the Yakima Central Plaza. Now on July 5th, just a few weeks ago, the Yakima City Council voted five to two to approve $12 million toward this, well, to approve the $12 million project. The city committed to supplying $3 million towards that total with the rest to be privately raised, donations, grants, uh, investments. Uh, so this is taking what is you could argue it's streets to some degree. There's certainly streets surrounding the parking lot, but take it into a public space. And it's hard to, it's hard to see with, with the rendering, but I'll talk about a couple of the things that, it's, that it includes um, as related to the strategies that we went through earlier. Improve streets as places, that's an obvious one. Uh, create multi-use squares and parks. It certainly is doing that. You're taking now, uh, you're, you're creating a destination. There's a water feature there uh, for kids. There is seating in both shaded areas and terraced seating areas, which suggests that there could be performances in the park as well, as you have almost a built-in amphitheater now uh, on a small scale, but certainly one that can encourage activity. 
uh, and build economies through markets. There are specific spaces here designed for vendors, uh, where vendors can set up shop and create that kind of an informal market. Uh, so it's great to see this happening in Yakima. Certainly a three-year process. There's politics involved in all of that, uh, as there is with any kind of large planning process. But uh, certainly the, the anticipation is that this will create a destination, a more usable, viable space that then will have great benefits for the downtown as well. Um, I wanted to note a couple of local projects uh, that are, are happening because these this placemaking is going on in your community now. Um, and some of you are probably very well aware of it, uh, maybe some aren't. I know in, in, with the Downtown Pasco Development Authority, uh, and welcome Luke, congratulations, uh, they're actually a, a relatively recent participant now in the state's Main Street program, I think uh, in 2014, or maybe it was just at the start of 2015, which is great. And what they have is, uh, one of their programs is Food Truck Friday, and I think this is great, and I want to thank Mary Lou Shea as well for getting, getting information on this, but uh, I, I, food trucks are obviously a national trend right now. Um, we know that, but they're also a, a hyper-local kind of program that you can, that you can do. Uh, and again, this relates to, I think, what Project for uh, Public Spaces talks about in, ter in terms of improving streets as public spaces. They have a, they have a, a study out that uh, is called Moving from Transit Routes, R-O-U-T-E-S, to Community Routes, R-O-O-T-S. And I think this Food Truck Friday really embodies one of the things that, that they're trying to accomplish or they're trying to espouse with, with that. Um, so, uh, the Food Truck Friday was launched last year uh, as part of a program with Pasco Specialty Kitchen, uh, which is a part of the Downtown Pasco Development Authority, and the goals were to create revenue opportunities for local entrepreneurs and food truck clients involved with the Pasco Specialty Kitchen, but also to generate buzz and foot traffic in Downtown Pasco. Hopefully some of you have been there and participated in Food Truck Friday, but it also activates space that is otherwise underutilized on a Friday evening. So you can see this area here, this area here where it otherwise would have been um, underused. So it's, it's great to see that. And while I just wanted to show a couple of, couple of slides of, of uh, the, both clients and vendors, uh, while food trucks represent a growing national trend, as I mentioned earlier, they are hyper-local in their application. They use local employees, they serve local customers, and they create local products um, and offer a variety of local cuisines as well. And so they um, also make money. Uh, the Pasco Specialty Kitchen has reported that in a season and a half since 2015, uh, they report over 145,000 in, rev in revenue generated for the food truck vendors, which, which is pretty good when you talk about it being, what, one night a month that this is, that this is occurring? Uh, or oh, it is weekly. You guys do do it every week. Okay. Uh, so uh, that kind of revenue for a mobile vendor is, is an important thing. And what I really like about this is the next step that Pasco took it to the next step with this mobile vending university. And uh, this, this is taking a look at, again, what your community wants and addressing it and responding to it. Demand for food trucks in Pasco far outweighed the supply of mobile vendors. So uh, through Pasco Specialty Kitchen and, and with Mary Lou Shea, it created the state's first certified educational series for mobile vendors it's offered through Columbia Basin College. You get a certificate. It already boasts 27 graduates, and the program's really intended to solidify mo mobile vendors as viable year-round businesses, uh, teaching the next generation of entrepreneurs. So a really cool program. Uh, yes, food trucks are around all over the place, but this is a way to actually use it as a community asset and then provide an educational component to it as well, which I just think is great. Um, I want to look over to Kennewick, the, the bridge to bridge, river to rail revitalization plan. I know this has been a long time in the making. This is probably something that, well, undoubtedly everyone in this room knows more about this plan than I do standing here. But what I wanted to uh, just note about it uh, in, in my brief review of the revitalization plan, one of the things that struck me uh, is that there's an action item related to the expansion of the Main Street approach. 
And I think the, the document notes the effectiveness of the historic downtown Kennewick partnership in working towards revitalization of the downtown core and now seeks to apply that same approach. It's one of the action items. This is something we want to do. Apply the same approach to adjacent neighborhoods in the revitalization zone as part of that plan. And I think the, the again, looking at the success of the Main Street program, its approach to revitalization, understanding that it can be applied not just in the downtown core, but in adjacent neighborhoods. It can be applied where we have other new development of spaces that will become public, how to tie those spaces into the existing fabric, even if it's going to be all new construction or a mix, you can still tie it in in a meaningful way. Uh, the fact that they have looked to the historic downtown Kennewick partnership and want to expand that Main Street approach, I think is, is really great and is forward thinking. The HDKP is a longstanding participant in the state's Main Street program. They're nationally certified as well, and they've been utilizing this approach for, for a good while, and it's paid off for them. Just in, in 2016 to date, uh, we're only halfway through, a little more, eight new businesses in the downtown core of Kennewick, 64 new jobs reported, nearly 710,000 in private investment, and 774 volunteer hours, which is great. We can't emphasize enough the importance of volunteers. And if there are more out there who want to volunteer in historic downtown Kennewick, I know there's a director here who would be happy to, happy to take you. Um, and I just wanted to kind of close here with a look at the Main Street approach. I think it, it really is, and again, many people may be familiar with it, but it really breaks down the approach of this graphic and lays out the interdependent relationship between people and places. Heritage assets connect, connected to the built environment. Um, well, heritage assets are connected to the built environment and the story a region has to tell. And these serve as a platform for entrepreneurs and the local public to engage in economically beneficial placemaking. So you can see this here. These are the four, these are the four points that are used, but it's really a heritage asset connected to that human asset. Um, and we are lucky here in Washington. I noted toward the start of my talk that nearly 90% of businesses in the U.S. have 20 or fewer employees. Well, it also turns out that Washington, by at least someone's measure, is a good place for these businesses to succeed. The small business, that same small business and entrepreneurial council released its 2016 small business tax index just last month. And that index ranks Washington fifth among all 50 states in terms of the best tax environment for small businesses. And in case you were wondering, California came in at number 50. Now, that doesn't mean running a small business in Washington is easy. Of course, it's not. But it at least suggests our state values its small business owners. I know some of you out there might be feeling, eh, I don't know if it does. But at least through this one index, we're getting, we're getting that sense. Um, and that's a, really, that's a really great and powerful thing. I think as we, uh, by 2030, I don't know how many people know this, but by 2030, urbanize, urbanization is happening throughout the country, right? By 2030, 14, only 14% 14 of the population will live in rural areas. By 2050, that will drop to 11%. All the rest will live in cities, defined as a region with, with 50,000 or more population. So all of our areas are becoming urbanized, and they're going to need these, these downtowns to have places to gather, to have places for civic discourse. Um, some of that, that urbanization isn't happening because everyone's moving to cities. It's happening because our cities are growing. Uh, Walla Walla is a newly urbanized area. It now has a regional population of over 50,000. If you'd said 20 years ago, went to Walla Walla and said, hey, you're going to be urbanized, people would probably shake their heads at you. But this is, this is happening. And so this Main Street approach, what we're doing in our downtowns matters and is important. I wanted to give, a, I, I can't be up here without giving a quick plug to the state's Main Street B&O Tax Credit Incentive Program. How many, by a show of hands, have, have donated to a Main Street program through this tax incentive? Oh, we need, we need a whole lot more hands than that. Congratulations to you, sir. I commend you for, for that. But um, we need a whole lot more. <laughs> the, uh, the program is, is, in short, businesses can donate to their local Main Street organizations, PASCO, Historica, Downtown Kennewick Partnership, Prosser, wherever, wherever there's a Main Street community, one of those 34. And 
when you make that donation, you receive a 75% tax credit on your B&O taxes in the, in the following year. So, some people say to me, well, if I only get a 75% credit, why would I actually increase my taxes by donating to these organizations? And my answer is, you actually have the very uh, powerful option of self-directing your taxes back to your community in a way that's going to result in reinvestment in your community and ultimately, hopefully, ideally, um, more sales, more property values, a revitalization of your overall downtown core. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great program. The challenge we have uh, is that right now this program is capped at $1.5 million in tax credits. In 2010, we only had 12 Main Street communities. That wasn't a problem. Today we have 34, which is great because it's, it, it shows the success of the program. Uh, but the problem is we're hitting that tax credit cap real early on. In 2016, by the first Monday of the year, January 4th, we had already hit that cap. And so we'll be looking in the next legislative session to have that cap doubled from 1.5 million to 3 million. Uh, I'll certainly seek any support that, that we can get, and I know some of our, our main streets will, uh, uh, d would be equally appreciative to see people support that kind of an increase. Uh, not, a, not, not a huge number in terms of the state's budget, but has a huge impact for, for our downtowns. Um, I just wanted to end my last slide. I, I love this. Does anyone know? Raise your hand if you know where this building is or know this project. I, I, this is, well, an underutilized industrial building uh, on the outskirts of Walla Walla's downtown. And when you look at it, 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 it's a great, robust, historic building. It's fantastic. Anyone can walk by and see this is a cool building. Uh, what happened to it is, is even cooler. This is what it looks like today, and it has become what is known as the powerhouse theater in Walla Walla. And I think this is a great example of, of placemaking from a private investment standpoint, but one that also was able to uh, work with city, uh, city government on policies and zoning and some of those type of use things. Uh, they turned this into a very professional theater, and you can see inside uh, some of the, the, the look from the mezzanine down onto the stage, what some of the um, uh, seating looks like. It's just a, a remarkable reuse of a building that uses historic preservation that took a look at, at the kind of creative uh, uh, jobs that they wanted to have, a performing arts center. It creates a public space now, even though it's in a, a privately owned building. But it's just a really, in my mind, a wonderful reuse of what otherwise would be a forgotten uh, industrial building. But it speaks to Walla Walla as well. So um, a really interesting reuse. All of your towns, all of your downtowns have these kinds of resources there. It's a matter of finding them. It's a matter of having some vision about how to use them. It's a matter of getting partnerships together to reuse them as best you can. Um, lastly, I got to put a plug in for the Washington Trust. We are a membership organization doing advocacy, so uh, we always appreciate new members. And with that, I am finished. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Gosh, let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. This was. Um, this was really just what, what we wanted. We were you know, always looking for new topics and uh, just with all of the work we've been doing with branding, I wanted to highlight all of the great work that's already going on and uh, you know, really just get people thinking about you know, what, what we could have in the Tri-City. So thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to come and speak today. I couldn't help when you were going through your, one of your slides. Um, I think our downtowns could take our bolder, brighter and add older, smaller, better into our, into our tagline slogan there. So there's an idea for the downtowns. Uh, and thank you also to, again, Frontier Communications for sponsoring our luncheon, our speaker, Chris Moore, our three downtown partner associations, and the wonderful staff here at the Three Rivers Convention Center, and Charter Communications for filming and rebroadcasting today's program across our region. And a sincere thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, our next luncheon, our congressional update with 
Congressman Dan Newhouse is one month from today on August 24th, right here at the Three Rivers Convention Center. Congressman Newhouse will provide us with legislative updates from Washington, D.C., as well as discuss key federal issues that impact Central Washington and the Tri-Cities. So please be sure to register for that luncheon. Uh, thank you so much for attending today. Be sure to visit the tables. We've got the downtown groups. I have some display tables. Chris will be here. Uh, we didn't have a chance for question and answers, but come grab Chris. I, I don't know when you're heading out of town, but I'm sure you've got lots of people who'd like to uh, get some more information from you. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. We'll see you next month.